Hi there, and welcome to Virtual Vacations, the latest and greatest series on Toldenstone.com. At a time when everyone's least favorite pandemic has us all thinking wistfully about travel, I figured there might be interest in a video series exploring and explaining some iconic historical destinations. The idea is to provide short tours of famous museums and ancient buildings, with a focus on the artifacts and features that make these places so special. With any luck, these tours will be equally interesting to armchair travelers and to those actually planning a trip. So let's get started. As usual, I am Garrett Ryan, comma, PhD, and in this video, we'll take a stroll through the vast and baffling Vatican Museums. If you've been to Rome, you've probably visited the Vatican Museums, and unless you have a high tolerance for crowds, odds are you didn't enjoy the experience very much. At last count, the Vatican Museums were the third most visited museum in the world, and it shows. First, you wait in a line that wraps halfway around Vatican City. Once you finally get in, you begin the death march to the Sistine Chapel. Museum fatigue sets in quickly. You stagger glassy-eyed past endless walls of art, with no food court or relief in sight. And when you finally reach the Sistine Chapel, you are too busy being pushed and pulled and elbowed by a squinting sea of humanity to do much more than peer heavenward, sigh, and move along. In the mad rush of the Sistine Chapel, the Vatican Museum's superb Roman collections are easy to overlook. The most famous and impressive pieces are in the rooms known as the Pio Clementine Museum, named, in case you want to impress your friends, for Popes Pius VI and Clement XIV. These rooms will be our focus today. We'll start, as visitors usually do, in the Cortile della Pina. This was designed by Donato Bramante, the same guy who devised the rotunda of St. Peter's Basilica. Originally, it was a long and narrow garden that connected the Vatican Palace with a summer house known as the Belvedere. Although the current courtyard is much shorter, the Belvedere facade remains much as Bramante planned it. This area is called the Cortile della Pina, that is, Courtyard of the Pinecone, because of the 12-foot bronze pinecone displayed there. The pinecone was originally the centerpiece of a Roman fountain. Sometime in the early Middle Ages, it was moved to the courtyard of old St. Peter's Basilica. There it served again as a fountain, and bubbled quietly away for seven centuries or so, until the old basilica was demolished, and the cone was moved here. The bronze peacocks on either side also stood in the courtyard of old St. Peter's. They came originally from Hadrian's mausoleum, where this symbolized immortality. It was thought, you see, that peacock meat never spoiled. Having duly admired the pine cone, let's enter the museum proper, where we almost immediately encounter the Apoxiomenos. This is a marble statue of an athlete drawing a scraper, what the Romans called a striggle, over his right arm. Ancient athletes rubbed their limbs with olive oil, which served both as sunscreen and moisturizer. Since this was an age before showers, they used scrapers to remove the oil, dust, and sweat from their skin when they were done exercising or competing. Like many other statues we'll discuss in this video, the Apoxiomenos is a Roman copy of a Greek masterpiece. Since all things Greek were fashionable among the Roman elite, Roman aristocrats frequently commissioned copies of famous Greek artworks to garnish their gardens, where they served essentially as high-class lawn gnomes. The original Apoxiomenos was crafted by the great Lysippus, otherwise famous for being the official sculptor of Alexander the Great. This particular copy was sculpted in the first century AD, about 400 years later. We don't really know how it stacks up against the original, but it's what we've got, so I guess it's masterpiece enough. Moving right along, we enter the octagonal courtyard, where the most famous statues are displayed. A long-time showstopper is just to your left when entering, the Apollo Belvedere. With the exception of a few bohemian years in the early 19th century, when Napoleon moved the statue to Paris, Apollo has been in the Vatican since 1511. For the better part of two centuries, this was probably the most famous statue on Earth, hailed as the paragon of classical art and classical beauty. It certainly is majestic. The lithe and youthful god stands poised, with a rather underutilized cloak slung from one shoulder. Originally, the left hand held a bow. The god Apollo had a grab bag of responsibilities. Music, medicine, the sun, and so forth. But he first appears in Greek literature as the god of archery, and was never shy about pincushioning anybody or anything that got in his way. You may have noticed that he also wasn't shy about sauntering about naked. 
As I discussed in one of my older videos, gods and heroes are often nude in Greek and Roman art, largely as a way of demonstrating their difference from the tunic-wearing masses. This figure, at least, would never be mistaken for a mortal. Crossing the octagonal courtyard, we encounter Lao Kuan and his sons, quite possibly the best-known bit of marble on the planet. There are several different stories about why Lao Kuan ended up being attacked by snakes. One of these claims that Lao Kuan got himself vipered after having sex in a temple, then is now usually a bad idea. But the most familiar story, immortalized by the Aeneid, is that Lao Kuan was a Trojan priest who warned his countrymen against bringing the Trojan horse inside the city walls. The goddess Athena, who supported the Greek cause, didn't appreciate this, and sent two immense serpents to silence him. Lao Kuan and his sons are frozen in the midst of their struggle with the serpents. Lao Kuan's chest swells as he grapples with one snake, which is about to sink its fangs into his hip. The other snake is just bitten his younger son, causing the boy to collapse in pain. The elder son struggles desperately to free himself from the serpent's coils. Everything is motion and agony, translated into marble with spellbinding clarity. Like so many Roman statues, Lao Kuan is a copy of a lost Greek masterpiece. It is, however, a very good copy, probably commissioned by an emperor for one of his pleasure gardens. When it was rediscovered in 1506, it caused a sensation. Pope Julius II, the founder of the Vatican Collections, bought it almost immediately. Napoleon seized the statue and brought it to the Louvre, but it was returned here from Napoleon's fall from power, albeit a bit the worse for wear, thanks to an incident involving a runaway sled in the Alps. Though there are many other fascinating artifacts in the octagonal courtyard, we'll move on now to the Animal Room, which contains well over a hundred statues, statuettes, and reliefs featuring creatures. Although almost all of these are Roman works, most were heavily restored in the 18th century. But there's plenty of genuine antique goodness here, like this splendid leopard, made of alabaster with inlaid marble spots. I'm also a fan of this crocodile. The Romans, by the way, knew crocs from beast hunts staged in the Colosseum and elsewhere. Augustus once set up a sort of gator farm in the Campus Martius. The most famous statue in the animal room is this one, which shows the Greek hero Meliager with the head of the Caledonian boar. The Caledonian boar was a fire-breathing, farm-wrecking, man-skewering menace, sent by Artemis to ravage the territory of a king who forgot to sacrifice to her. Word of the wise, always count your victims twice before sacrificing. The desperate king sent out a call to every available hero in Greece, promising the hide and tusks of the boar to the champion who brought the beast down. The ensuing hunt was led by the young prince Meliager. But the greatest hunter proved to be Atalanta, a woman raised, Jungle Book style, by animals, and incredibly skilled with the bow. Meliager fell in love with Atalanta, and they slew the boar together, Atalanta striking it with one of her arrows, and Meliager finishing it off with his spear. This statue shows Meliager just after he's killed the boar. Originally, he had the fatal hunting spear in his right hand. The boar's huge head is propped on a tree trunk to the right. To the left is Meliager's hunting dog, which belongs to the swift and slender Laconian breed. Before we leave the animal room, check out the oversized camel head by the window on the right-hand side. That was part of a Roman fountain, and spouted water from its mouth. From the animal room, we cross into the imposing, but rather generically named, Gallery of Statues. The highlight here is the sleeping Ariadne, which shows, well, Ariadne sleeping. Ariadne was the daughter of King Minos of Crete, proprietor of the vast and inescapable labyrinth, a prototype of the Vatican Museums. The labyrinth was haunted by the terrible Minotaur, who dined on human flesh. When Theseus came to Crete, vowing to kill said Minotaur, Ariadne fell in love with the dashing young prince. She secretly gave Theseus a ball of twine so that he would never lose his way in the twisting corridors, and a sharp sword for Minotaur stabbing. Theseus used both to good effect, and fled Crete with Ariadne. But about halfway back to Athens, when they stopped for the night on the island of Naxos, Theseus abandoned Ariadne and sailed on alone. This statue shows Ariadne sleeping restlessly, about to wake and find Theseus gone. Until the 18th century, by the way, this statue was identified as Cleopatra, since the bracelet on Ariadne's arm was misinterpreted as a small serpent. The statue of Ariadne is set atop an unrelated sarcophagus, which shows snake-footed giants battling the gods. 
Although the giants are wielding tree trunks and boulders, they are clearly out of their league. One in the middle has already been struck down by a thunderbolt of Zeus. The other famous piece in the gallery of statues is Apollo Sauroctonus, that is, Apollo the Lizard Killer. It shows a youthful Apollo stalking a lizard crawling up a tree trunk. Originally, the god's right hand held an arrow for skewering his prey. This statue, yet another Roman copy of a lost Greek masterpiece, may be a playful allusion to the mature Apollo's slaying of the great dragon Python. The adjacent room, the Gallery of Busts, contains a goodly assortment of imperial heads and shoulders. You can find all the usual suspects here, from Augustus onward. I'd like to focus, however, on this couple, often called Cato and Portia. The real names were Libanus and Crite. Although both were freed slaves, they obviously became wealthy later in life, or else they couldn't have afforded such nice tomb portraits. Crite's hairstyle allows us to date the portraits to the early 1st century AD. If you look closely, you can see that she is wearing two rings in her left hand. Her husband, however, only has one, a signet ring on the little finger of his left hand. Note also how much younger Crite is than her husband. Though this is partly a matter of artistic convention, it's likely that Libanus, like most Roman men, was at least a decade older than his wife. After gawking at the portraits, we move on to the mask room, named the ancient mosaic set in the floor. The most noteworthy statue here is the Clone of Venus, the best and most famous copy of the Aphrodite of Knidos. The original Aphrodite of Knidos was created by the great sculptor Praxiteles. Like this copy, it showed the goddess setting aside her tunic as she prepared for her bath. One hand strategically covers her genitals. Otherwise, she is completely nude. Despite its controversial lack of drapery, this was the first full-size female nude in the history of Greek art, the original Aphrodite of Knidos was hailed as a masterpiece and came to be regarded as the ideal of female beauty. The model for the goddess was reportedly the famous Athenian courtesan Phryne, who was so shapely, it was said, that she once won a court case simply by exposing her breasts. People came to Knidos from every corner of the classical world to goggle at the statue. For those who wanted souvenirs, erotic pottery was available for purchase nearby. Once you manage to tear yourself away from the allure of Aphrodite, head over to the Room of the Muses. The centerpiece here is the mangled mass of marble known as the Belvedere Torso. Originally, this was a statue of the Greek hero Ajax, shown contemplating suicide after disgracing himself in the final weeks of the Trojan War. Renaissance artists had no idea who this torso belonged to, but they were in awe of its masterful anatomy. Michelangelo repeatedly referenced the torso in his works. Probably the most famous of these allusions is the awe-inspiring figure of Christ in The Last Judgment. The influence is even more obvious in the figure of St. Bartholomew, shown in almost the exact pose of the Belvedere torso. As you may have heard, by the way, the flayed skin Bartholomew is holding is a self-portrait of Michelangelo, a little Counter-Reformation style fun, I guess. Continuing into the descriptively named Round Room, we encounter this enormous basin, almost 16 feet in diameter. It's remarkable not so much for its size as for its substance. The basin's made, you see, of porphyry, a stone mined only in Egypt's eastern desert. Every bit of porphyry had to be hauled over the burning sands to the Nile, brought downstream to Alexandria, and then shipped across the Mediterranean and down the Tiber to Rome. Besides being ludicrously inaccessible, porphyry was also very difficult to carve. But since it was more or less the same color as imperial purple, the emperors liked it and underwrote the immense costs of shipping and shaping it. This basin was probably custom carved for one of the great imperial bath complexes. Perhaps the most interesting statue in the circular room is this colossal image of Antinous, the Emperor Hadrian's young lover. A tireless traveler, Hadrian brought Antinous along on many of his tours of the provinces. During a stay in Egypt, as Hadrian and company were sailing up the Nile, Antinous drowned under mysterious circumstances. The heartbroken emperor declared that Antinous was now a god, and the rest of the empire shrugged and agreed. Shrines of Antinous rose throughout the provinces, and hundreds of cities commissioned statues of the drowned boy in divine guise. This is one of those statues. It shows Antinous with the attributes of two more familiar gods, Dionysus, god of wine and revelry, and Osiris, 
the Egyptian god of the dead. The ivy crown on his head and basket by his feet are attributes of Dionysus. The pine cone stuck on the crown is a restorer's mistake. Originally, this statue had the cobra crown of Osiris. A few niches down from Antinous, we find this colossal bronze Hercules. The statue, frankly, is pretty ugly, partly because its face was squashed when it toppled in antiquity. But it is bronze, and that's remarkable in itself, since the vast majority of the ancient world's bronze statues were melted for scrap in the Middle Ages. This particular statue survived, believe it or not, because it was struck by lightning. Roman religious scruples insisted that any statue blasted by lightning was sacred to Jupiter and had to be buried on the spot. After a lingering last look at the circular room, we continue to the final stop on our tour, the Greek cross room. The stars here are two huge porphyry sarcophagi, both made for relatives of the Emperor Constantine. We'll start with the sarcophagus of Helena, Constantine's mother. It's not an artistic triumph, but it is big and flashy. It shows Roman cavalry riding down, or possibly, since perspective was not the sculptor's strong suit, riding behind, a row of barbarian prisoners. Above, on the corners, are portraits of Helena and Constantine. The military theme decoration suggests that this sarcophagus was made for Constantine himself. Since Constantine ended up being buried in Constantinople, however, it was given to Helena instead. It stood in the ruins of her mausoleum outside Rome till the 12th century, when a pope who thought very highly of himself had it repurposed as his own tomb. It was restored to the condition you see now in the 17th century, and, since porphyry is so hard to work, it took a team of 25 sculptors nine full years to finish the job, or at least that's what they told the Pope. The other sarcophagus belonged to Constantia, Constantine's oldest daughter. Constantia had a rather turbulent life. First, she was married off to her cousin. A couple years later, her brothers had her husband killed, and she was forced to marry another, slightly more distant cousin. Her brother was on the point of killing this guy, too, when Constantia suddenly died of fever. Her remains were sent to Rome and interred in this sarcophagus. The sides show winged cupids, who, despite being a bit under any reasonable drinking age, are enthusiastically harvesting grapes and making wine. Though this was a fairly generic scene in Roman sarcophagi, it may have been given Christian meaning in this instance, with the cupids symbolizing workers in the Lord's vineyard. Or at least, that's what they told the Pope. In the near future, I hope to post more videos about the churches and museums of Rome and Istanbul. To be sure you don't miss out, feel free to subscribe. If that isn't enough to stone action, and really, can you ever have too much? You can also follow my new Instagram and Twitter accounts, where I post pictures and fun facts from my travels. So, tune in next time, and as always, thanks for watching.